Hello everyone, welcome to your lecture on the brain, primarily the structures and the functions. Please understand that this is content that we will not be covering as in-depth in class, but it is incredibly important that you learn all of the structures and their associated functions. This will set up the basis for pretty much everything that we talk about further in this class. We're going to begin with the regions of the brain. We're going to talk about three major regions of the brain. What you may find is that in other courses, the brain will be divvied up into different regions. Some courses will talk about a mammalian brain versus a reptilian brain. If you hear those terms, essentially what they're talking about is newer or higher order formed areas of the brain that are going to be utilized by humans or um, apes, while the reptilian brain, those are going to be structures that are going to be universal to most animals. For this course, however, we're going to separate the brain into three sections, and it's going to be the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. Now, the brain stem as a structure is going to be something that is going to include both hindbrain and midbrain functions. So the brain stem itself is not going to be a separate section. It is not synonymous with hindbrain. Please make sure that you understand that. So when we talk about these things, hindbrain, basic survival. This is often what people refer to when they're talking about the reptilian brain. The midbrain, this is going to be towards more of the interior or the center of the brain. It's going to help with simple movement, sensory information. Um, think of it as almost like a massive distribution center. And the forebrain. This is what we're going to usually refer to when we're talking about the mammalian brain. And that's going to have your limbic system, which is going to have your kind of emotional regulation, um, memories, uh, some of your higher order kind of uh, behaviors. And then it's also going to have the four lobes or the four cortexes of the brain. When we start talking through these, the hindbrain is going to have three structures that you need to memorize. The midbrain, you will have a single structure that you need to memorize. And the forebrain, honestly, it's like 11 or 12 different structures that you need to memorize. I will do my best to give you some hints on how to remember them, but truly this will require that you go back and study. Flashcards could be your best friend right here. We're going to start with the hindbrain. When looking at the hindbrain, the three major structures that you need to know are the cerebellum, the medulla, and the pons. The cerebellum is going to look like almost a separate structure from the brain. It's sometimes referred to as the little brain. As we learn more about the brain, we're finding more and more about this structure having much more importance than just basic life support. The medulla and the pons, these tree structures are going to be located on the brain stem. With both of these structures, please remember that the brain stem itself is going to continue into the middle of the brain. So they are hindbrain structures, while later we'll talk about a structure called the reticular formation that runs through the brainstem and terminates at the midbrain. So brainstem is going to be different than hindbrain. Hindbrain is the most basic. We see these structures in pretty much all animals. So the first one we talk about is the medulla. And for medulla, I always or try to remember medulla with uh, something that sounds similar, and so medulla medieval. And if you want to think about the best way to kill someone in medieval times, you would have just chopped their head off. Now, the reason that I use this as my memory or my mnemonic for the medulla is because it's this structure at the very, very base of your brainstem where essentially the spinal column attaches to the brainstem. This structure itself, this bundle of neurons, helps with blood circulation breathing, maintaining muscle tone, the fact that you are probably either uh, sitting upright or maybe even just kind of propping your head up on your hand and laying in bed, any of those things require muscle tone. Um, we often have to maintain muscle tone without ever thinking about it. It's the only way that we stay upright. Uh, it's going to help us with things that are going to be reflex-based, like sneezing and coughing. Now, we don't really think about that, but anytime a foreign particle gets into your airway, the best way for us to deal with that is to sneeze or to cough. And then also salivating. Very first step to eating food is salivating. We do this at an unconscious level. So this structure in the brain functions as a basic life support. Even a very tiny hemorrhage to the area of that is being uh, supplied blood to this area of the brain, if that were to rupture, that would be instantaneous death. So 
this very specific area of the hindbrain supports our breathing, our blood circulation, our muscle tone, things that we don't think about, but things that we absolutely rely upon to be alive. We're going to move from the medulla up to the pons. When we're talking about the pons, the pons is going to be a structure that's involved in sleep and arousal. This structure is part of the hindbrain and it is located on the brain stem. The very important purpose of the pons is that during your sleep stage, when you go into a dream, when we go into what's called REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, this stage is where you have your very vivid dreams, whether they're in color or sound, there's visuals, there's motion, there's emotion, all of those things are present. Something must prevent your body from actively acting out what's going on. So your body is paralyzed during this state. The pons is the structure in the brain that essentially blocks any motor messages coming from the motor cortex of your frontal lobe from making it to your body. In a sense, you are paralyzed. The other thing is that the pons helps with arousal. And when we talk about arousal in psychology, we're talking about alertness, awakefulness, um, being present in the moment. And so this will also help you reverse that and feel more awake. There will be another structure that acts more like an on-off switch to our alertness. And we'll talk about that. That's going to be the single structure that you need to know from the midbrain. So for the pons, know that it helps with sleep and arousal during your REM state. This is what blocks any motor messages and that it also attaches the cerebellum to the brainstem. It's a bundle of fibers that kind of wraps around and anchors it. The cerebellum I mentioned briefly before is often known as the little brain. Now, this little brain used to be thought of as just kind of a subset of the brain, that it wasn't really important. And the more we learn about the brain, we more the more we learn that the cerebellum is incredibly important and is taking on a lot of higher order functions than what we thought before. So the cerebellum is going to look like a separate structure that is just at the base of the brain. Now, it is not technically part of the brain stem itself, but it connects to the brain stem. If you play an instrument, and you can coordinate your hands to play the instrument really well. That's your cerebellum at work. If you can walk heel to toe and alternate feet left, right, that ability to coordinate, that smooth coordination, that's coming from your cerebellum. If you can write smoothly with a pen or a pencil and you can grip it in your fingertips as opposed to kind of wrapping your entire hand around it, that's your cerebellum. So all of these really what we call fine coordinated muscular movements that we use continuously. That's coming from your cerebellum. The cerebellum also is going to help you with your balance or your sense of equilibrium. So finding your horizon, making sure that you're not, um, you know, dizzy or imbalanced. And then the last thing that we really get from the cerebellum that's really important for us is this idea of procedural memories. Procedural memories or are going to be the how to do memories. So you may have remembered from one of your readings that after you have repeated a neural pattern over and over and over again, eventually you don't process it in the same area of the brain. It goes to a different area of the brain just to kind of be stored. And that's what happens with motor memory. When we talk about muscle memory or motor memory or these things, the first couple times you do anything physical, you concentrate very, very deeply on it. But after repetition, it becomes almost second nature. That's a procedural memory. They're stored in the cerebellum. So commands for muscle movement come from the motor cortex, which is going to be in the frontal lobe of your brain. However, what allows it to be integrated and not jerky and very smooth comes from the cerebellum. When we talk about organizing sensory information that guides movement, we're talking about our sense of balance or what we'll later call our kinesthetic sense. The fact that you know where your feet are without ever having to look at them, that comes from a really cool relay system between tendons and nerve cells. Your brain sends out a message to your foot saying, where are you in space? It sends a message back, the cerebellum processes it, and you go, oh, I know where my foot is. Really, the only thing that disrupts that is if you have a body part that falls asleep. You restrict the blood flow to it, that also cuts off the firing from the neurons. And so you later get that pins and needles feeling. It's when all of that firing goes back to the brain and the brain's processing these messages that were absent. Um, when we're talking about that, that might be the only time that you have a hard time locating a limb or a body part in space. But if you've ever watched an acrobat or a gymnast or um, a figure skater, 
They have this amazing ability to know where their limbs are in space, and most athletes do too. That's coming from the cerebellum. The reason I have the idea of a DUI test up here, the reason that the two most kind of basic but also required DUI tests that are given by the state of Virginia, one is called the walk and turn. You walk out 10 steps, you turn around, you walk back, and then the other is called the one-legged stand. These are mandatory by the state, and it's because your cerebellum is the first structure of the brain really impacted by alcohol, and so when that structure is depressed, you start to lose your balance. And then I did talk to you guys about procedural memories. These are your how to do memories, not the stories of yourself or what happened yesterday, but literally the physical memories that you have. Here's a diagram of those three structures. In the pink, you're seeing the pons. Sleep, arousal, shuts off motor messages to the lower parts of the body. The medulla, right at the base of the skull. So again, medulla, medieval death, you put a knife or a sword through that and the person's dead, well, let's just say you damage the medulla, you're going to be dead. And the cerebellum, that's your sense of balance, procedural memories, coordinated muscle movements. Uh, one student once told me that they remembered the word PONS by turning it into an acronym and it was perfect one night sleep. I had another student tell me that he would never want to fall asleep in a pond. So that was their way of trying to remember PONS. Cerebellum, I'm sure there's probably some mnemonic device in there. However, I really just go through and we'll talk about it so much. I memorized the major kind of contributing factors of the cerebellum. Now we're on to the midbrain. For the midbrain, there is a single structure that you need to know. Before we get to it, please understand that this is a region. It's an area. So there's more than just one structure there, but it's an area that's located between the spinal cord and the hindbrain and the forebrain. So again, literally middle of the brain. It is the area with the highest dopamine production. So this area of the brain we think is where many of our neurotransmitters are going to be produced and then they travel outward to other areas of the brain. It helps with coordinated movements and sensory information. And the great thing about this, you need to know one structure that is going to run through the midbrain, and that's called your reticular formation. Now, before I told you that the PONS does with, or deals with sleep and arousal, the reticular formation also deals with sleep and arousal. Now, just because they are very similar in how we describe what they do, you will never see these two together in a possible answer set. But the reticular formation has more of an on-off switch type responsibility for your body. And what I mean is when you go to sleep, what can possibly turn you off, like literally put you out, is your reticular formation. Some of you guys may have experienced micro sleeps where you close your eyes and you're out for like 10 or 20 seconds and then you kind of like pop back up and you're like, whoa, was I asleep? You probably were. That was probably your reticular formation putting you to sleep. That can be incredibly dangerous. It's a huge indicator of massive sleep deprivation, um, especially while driving. We have had some of the most horrific car accidents and, you know, death-related crashes because of people driving drowsy. Um, when we look at this, this is going to put you to sleep, and then it will also simultaneously help wake you back up. This will also react to fight-or-flight signals. But primarily for this one, you want to know that while it can help you cause general alarm in your body, you know, that kind of sense of, you know, impending doom, get ready for a fight or flight situation, um, it's really important in helping you fall asleep and stay asleep. If there were damage to this structure of the brain, it could cause you to lapse into a coma. The reticular formation is a bundle of nerve fibers that runs through the brainstem and terminates in the middle of the brain. So what you're looking at here is the brown structures to the interior, that's your reticular formation. The part that's at the very top, that's a thalamus. That's actually a forebrain structure. The part that's dead in the center, well, that part that wraps around, not the kind of weird striated part, that's your pons. Just below it is the medulla, and then off to the far right hand, that is going to be your cerebellum. So it literally runs through the center of your brainstem. We're now onto the forebrain. 
this area, you want to make sure that you are studying and using flashcards. It's going to help you, I promise. So the first structure we're going to talk about is the thalamus. And the thalamus is going to be the relay station for sensory messages except for your sense of smell. Your sense of smell is directly processed in the cerebral cortex. It doesn't go through the thalamus. So think of this as a identification and relay center. It identifies a neural message as a visual message and sends it back to the occipital lobe. It'll identify an auditory message as an auditory signal and send it to the temporal lobe. And if you think about it, right now you're receiving both visual and auditory messages. It's this structure in the brain that's sending them to the right part of the brain so you can actually be aware of what's going on. So it will take care of this for all senses except for your sense of smell. The other thing, you have a left thalamus and a right thalamus. In fact, most of the brain is set up with this duality, a left and a right side, just like you have a left and a right lung, a left and a right kidney, a left and a right leg. As humans, we are set up with almost this kind of dual nature. Even our heart has a left and a right chamber. Remember that you are crosswired. So information comes into one side and then gets processed on the other. It switches over. So you have a left thalamus and a right thalamus. Information will cross over at an area called the corpus callosum to share information back and forth. What you want to make sure that you're aware of is that as information comes in, your thalamus is going to send it to the right cortex of the brain. And by right, I mean correct cortex of the brain. So it's a cluster of cell bodies. It's active in integrating information.